Hello and welcome to our second part of women's Bible study looking at the Old Testament King David. Quick reminder that part one was probably more important than part two. So if you did not happen to bump into part one, be sure that you do. In part one, we took a look at David's connection to Jesus. Today, we're going to take a look at David's connection to us. I like looking at it in those two pieces, but since Jesus is more important than I am, I'd very much encourage you to back up and take a peek at number one if you haven't had the chance to do so already. Let me mention a couple of introductory things for today. This is similar to stuff that I've covered the other times that I bumped into this class, but I adjust them a little bit as I learn more from taking a look at more of these Old Testament characters. Some things I've really enjoyed about learning from the Old Testament, these folks. One is, hey, we get to see less well-known parts of the Bible. That's a benefit. And I'm glad you're a part of this study doing that. We also remember that God works through minor characters. People like Ruth, people like you and me. We also learn that God works through incredibly flawed people like David, and also like you and me. I think it's also important for us to take a peek at some of these characters from the Old Testament because, hey, here's the thing. You and I probably find more relatable the minor characters of the Bible than the major character of the Bible. Major character of the Bible is God. That's just a good thing. Heard we mentioned this already? David and Jesus, that was part one. David and us, that's for today, part two. Here's some stuff about King David. David is an incredibly popular Old Testament figure. I don't know how scientific these research studies are, but read one time that they asked Christians to name, they couldn't say God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. They asked them to name their favorite New Testament and favorite Old Testament person. And what they found was that there was a fair bit of, I don't know, similarity. A lot of people listed Paul as their favorite New Testament character. And the most people listed David as their favorite Old Testament character, which I think is interesting. It's also interesting because David was incredibly popular, not just with modern people answering research questions, David was also an incredibly popular figure, for instance, at Jesus' time. During Jesus' time, in the first century, the people were longing for a return to the glory years of the great kingdom. And they felt like the kingdom had peaked under David, only their second king kingdom peaks pretty early. In addition, David is popular during the first century, during Jesus' public ministry, just like he was popular in the last handful of hundred years of what we call the Old Testament era. The reason for that is because, as we heard in last weekend's Old Testament reading, the people are longing for a return of the great King David, that he who was once king will be king again. Maybe they thought the actual David was going to show back up. You and I know that God was talking about something else, that he was talking about bringing his son from the line of David to shepherd his people. See, you and I don't tend to care about that sort of stuff as much as they did. We don't have a kingdom here that needs a human ruler. We care about it a little bit because... It's important for us to see that God keeps his promises, promises that he made in his covenant with David, also promises he makes through his prophets. The reason I think why someone like David is so incredibly popular is a couple of reasons. One, like last session, because we see so much similarity between someone like David and Jesus. Two, this is kind of this session. One of the reasons why I think people latch on to David is 
not because of his work as shepherd, king, warrior, poet, whatever, but because he is a sinner. And that, if you didn't know, is the most easily relatable quality that we can find in anyone else. But talking about David simply as a sinner is probably not quite enough. What I would like to do is I would like to talk about David as the confessor of sin. And maybe that's why modern day Christians still latch on to this shepherd king from so, so long ago. I know you've heard me say this stuff before, but you see, we have a tendency to put all biblical characters, especially these ancient ones, in solely their best light. But when we do that, we miss a big point, which is that God forgives and works through broken people. Here's kind of my examples. When we think about Old Testament Abraham, we remember how incredibly and heroically faithful he was. He was. But we skip the lack of faith that came with his complaints to God, also com also his attempted workaround with Hagar when God was not quick enough in keeping his promise. When we think about Old Testament Joseph, we remember his incredible endurance, which was incredible, heroic. But sometimes when we see him only in a stained glass window, we forget that even though what his brothers did was grossly, grossly wrong, after everything that he said to them, telling them his dreams about how they'll bow down to him, they would not have been wrong to at least want to punch him in the nose. You see, we forget that Joseph, before he endures suffering, before God uses his suffering to create a person of character, we forget that before all that, he was a spoiled little brat, just like spoiled little brats you might know. And why exactly we do that with these Old Testament heroes is, I don't know, it's hard to know. Sometimes, I guess, we just read ancient history with rose-colored glasses. We want to clean up the unsightly parts of what these great heroes did. Sometimes I think it's even simpler than that. We know the Bible's a holy book, so we look for holy things in it. But here's the problem with that kind of approach. When we forget the weaknesses of the people whose lives are captured inside the pages of the Bible, they become significantly more difficult for us to relate to. And if we don't relate to their brokenness, you see, you and I could walk away from a children's Bible and think that God only does great things through great people. But when we read the pages of the real Bible, we should know that God does the opposite, which is that he works through weak people to make sure that his strength is obvious. And since his most important work is forgiveness leading to salvation, if we don't remember how weak and broken these people's lives are, their behavior is, then we fail to see God up to his main thing, forgiveness. With that said, of course it is good for us to see examples of people's lives of faithfulness. We need pictures of folks who have gone before us who lived faithful lives so that we can imitate them. But we also need to remember that along with their moments of faithfulness, they also had moments of unfaithfulness. And we should learn from someone like David what to do with that kind of moment. Take it to God, confess it, and pray for his forgiveness. When we do that, we see maybe a bigger, a fuller picture the one that God seems to be showing us over and over again in his pages of the Bible, that even the best people are imperfect, just as we are imperfect. And if they are to find forgiveness, 
They find it in the same way as you and me, coming to God in confession and throwing ourselves before his mercy. All right, so David and us. David as the great confessor of sin. All right, David's life probably has numerous imperfections we could point to, but the most obvious one in his life is the very best example for us, and it's one that the Bible hones in on, slows down, and takes time to talk about. This is recorded for us in 2 Samuel 11, and we get to the prophet Nathan, that'd be 2 Samuel 12. If you're familiar with 2 Samuel 11, here are some parts of this phase of David's life that are memorable. The chapter begins by telling us that David is already beginning to abandon his duty as king. Had he been off doing what kings are supposed to do in the spring of the year, which is to protect the borders of their people, had he been faithful to that role, he wouldn't have been in Jerusalem to commit this grievous sin anyhow. But instead of out fighting, as a king should do this time of year, David has become a lazy king. And in his laziness, lounging around his palace, he's tempted into even greater sin. He sees a woman and he wants her, covets her. Even though she is not his wife, and in addition to not being his wife, she is also someone else's wife. Seems to me that in 2 Samuel 11, we see David's advisors trying to hint at the king that what he's doing isn't right. Is not this Bathsheba, they say? the daughter of, the wife of. It's like they're trying to gently say to David, hey, she's not just an object. She's a person. You might know her dad. You might know her husband. But David, he wants what he wants. And unfortunately, because he's king, he has the power to make things happen. So he finds servants who are willing to go get Bathsheba and bring her to him. Shortly thereafter, Bathsheba communicates back that she is in fact pregnant. Because her husband has been off at war, there will be no doubt to that poor soldier that his wife has been unfaithful. In an effort to cover his sin, David hatches a plot. But unfortunately for him, in his darkness, he has forgotten that some people still leave, lead lives of righteousness and light. You see, Uriah is faithful to his people because his brothers in arms are at war because they are sleeping on rocks in the ground, he refuses, even after he's called home, he refuses to go be in the comfort of his own bed next to his own wife. So David tries something else. Let's bring him in. Let's get him drunk. Certainly his moral compass will fail once he's had too much to drink. So Uriah, home from the front lines, gets to feast and drink. And yes, he gets drunk. But even drunk, Uriah has a stronger moral compass than the king. He refuses to go home to the comfort of his own bed and his own wife while his battle buddies are out in the field. So David's plot has to get thicker and darker and entangle more people. And I noticed, reading 2 Samuel 11, that in his effort to get Uriah killed in a way that looks normal, he has to employ other people, has to talk with his commanders in the field, 
has to have them find a way for Uriah to be in a place where he's likely to die and then have others pull back. And not only is this wrong, but I want you to notice that other people die in this effort. When David's commander writes back and says, hey, or sends message back through an emissary, this guy died and that guy died. David sends word back that's dismissive and shows his desire to push responsibility somewhere else. Mm. The sword cuts, sometimes this, sometimes that. And if it's not incredibly clear what the author of 2 Samuel is trying to say, the final verse wraps it all up. Because maybe, 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 you could be reading those pages and think to yourself, look, uh, people in power, they just live lives that are different than ours. The guy does something wrong, but he can tug on enough strings to make it go away. But then these words happen. The thing that David had done, it displeased the Lord. Maybe if his servants are quiet, maybe if his commanders are quiet, maybe if Bathsheba is quiet, then all this would go away, David thought. But maybe he forgot that God he sees the inside. Suddenly, the prophet Nathan is given a word from God to go speak to the king. Nathan shows us something incredibly important, that though he is not as powerful as the king, worldly speaking, still he brings the word of God, because the word of God still applies to the king. The king is not above the law. Nathan's way of doing that is incredibly, incredibly amazing, poetic. Tells a story about a rich man who robs a poor man of his only possession, slaughters the poor man's only sheep to feed his guests a lavish meal. David is incensed until Nathan says, O king, you're the rich man in the story. Uriah is the poor man in the story. And it is clear from the words that God brings to David through Nathan that David's attempt to remove responsibility from himself, that does not fly in God's eyes. I'm the one who's given you all of this. You're the one who has decided that what I have given is not enough. You and I know what happens. David, we now know to be kind of a bad guy. We also know him to be slothful. He's lazy. Not doing what kings are supposed to be supposed to be doing this time of year. Also, he's lust filled. Just looking out, sees a woman who he desires. Big deal, David. But him? He sends people to find out, brings her in. Now these words of God are brought to him. He sees his sin, understands his responsibility. And what does he do? He confesses his sin. And upon confessing his sin, he is immediately greeted with a word of forgiveness. But do note, also, some consequences. Maybe you're familiar. Psalm 51 is a beautiful confession of David. A great thing that you and I could read when we think about David as a model for us. Not only in the wonderful things that God worked through him, but also the wonderful things that God worked on him. Forgiveness. If you haven't before, read Psalm 51. It's David's poetic confession before God. It's a prayer for mercy. And it's also an acknowledgement that in the end, all sin is sin against God. 
In Psalm 51, David clearly acknowledges his responsibility. Gone is that desire to be like, well, you know, these things happen. He also acknowledges that wonderful things like life and forgiveness, that those are only available from God. Psalm 51 also shows us that our proper response to hearing God's word of forgiveness to us is to do what David does do in a positive sense in much of his life after this. He leads other people to that wonderful message of God as well. So here are some things I would love for us to learn from David, the David and us lesson of women's Bible study. One thing I want you to see from this David, Uriah, Bathsheba, Nathan, I want you to see that sin is dangerous. In part, sin is dangerous because ultimately anything we do wrong is in the end against God. But also because sin has a tendency to entangle, entangles others. Uriah, the righteous person in that chapter of the Bible, who is out doing what he's supposed to do, his vocation as citizen soldier, someone who shows himself to be someone that we would want to model ourselves after, he loses his life in David's effort to cover up his sin. And listen, I know that maybe in my little life, in your little life, maybe the stakes aren't as big as they were in this moment. But that doesn't excuse us. Sin can be dangerous, not just because it separates us from God, but also because it can entangle other people. And that's not right. Another thing we should learn from David is that we should be less eager to remove responsibility from ourselves so easily. We have a cultural obsession with this, by the way, to feel responsible for things we aren't responsible for, but then to try to shirk responsibility for things we are responsible for. We do something wrong and we blame, I don't know, our parents. We do something wrong and we blame the government. Listen, when you do something wrong, you know who's responsible? You. Me. Our desire to push that responsibility away, we see it here in the pages of the Bible. It's not healthy for us because it doesn't lead us toward the next important steps, which are things like this. When we make mistakes, we should be honest about our failings and we should confess it before God. Just like David does when Nathan brings these words. And like you heard me say, Nathan brings a word of forgiveness almost immediately to David when he confesses. But Uriah, he's still dead. You see, when you and I receive God's forgiveness, God's forgiveness removes the eternal consequences of sin. But because sin entangles, sometimes we still have to deal with consequences from it in life. The forgiveness of eternal consequences, that's the most important thing, but doesn't necessarily make the next days easier. So in the end for us, David is a hero of the faith. But he's not a hero of the faith because of his faithfulness. He's a hero of the faith because God's faithfulness toward him. See, David is a wonderful model for us. Wonderful because he's so relatable in his brokenness. He is so clearly and obviously imperfect, and we are too. But he does the right thing with his imperfection in the end. Takes it to the right place. He comes before God. And having received God's forgiveness, goes on to lead his people in confession and in worship. Just like we see here, sin is best not hidden. It's best exposed to the light of God's word where we can receive forgiveness. We have this tendency to try to push responsibility toward other people, 
that might make us feel good for a moment, but is not as good and as lasting as forgiveness is. I want to show you a painting I found of David. So I think it's kind of interesting. It's called David and Nathan, David the king, Nathan the prophet, something like that. So you see the figure in the center. That's Nathan. I can't tell in this instant if this is the moment where he's saying to David, you are the man for the story. But you can see there David the king suddenly has a hand on his head in realization of what he's done. And he topples down to the floor. His hands are open wide in a posture of receiving, humble receiving of God's mercy, acknowledging what he's done. Well, here's what I think is kind of interesting about this painting. I mean, I like it already, but the figure in the, I don't know, top right quadrant of this canvas. See, I think that's supposed to be King David also. You probably can't read, and I can only read a little bit of the words that are around the figures to the upper right of the prophet Nathan's head. It actually says Nathan. The letter is above David's head, both when he's sitting on the throne and when he is in the posture of humble confession. That says David. Well, in the very top right above that fourth figure's head, that word is not a name. That word means repentance. So here's how I'm reading this image. I think what we're supposed to see here is Nathan bringing the word of God to David. David confesses and falls down. And I think that figure in the top right is David at a later date. You see, maybe under his right hand, there's a scroll. I think this is us seeing David write the words of Psalm 51, that great confession of sin and trust in God for forgiveness. I didn't quite catch that initially because that figure looks younger than the person on the throne and the one on the floor. But I think what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to see that he is returned to his humble beginnings, no longer, no longer fooled by his earthly power. We see him now in humble rags, gone are the great flowy gowns of royalty. Now he's in simplicity. He shaves his beard as an act of some kind of sorrow. And now he ponders, ponders what he's done again, and also ponders God's great forgiveness and begins to scribble it down so that it could be a model for you and for me. All right. For our closing prayer for today, I thought about a prayer that we use during the services that we use during Lent midweek services. I think we probably have just sung a version of Psalm 51 at this point in time in the service. And then we come before God with a prayer. A prayer not linking David to Jesus, another shepherd king, but this time linking David to us, that we would see in him ourselves an imperfect person who ought to do the right thing with our mistakes, bring him before God and seek his forgiveness. We pray. Almighty and merciful Father, you freely forgive those who, as David of old, acknowledge and confess their sins. Create in us pure hearts and wash away all our sins in the blood of your dear Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Great being with you. Look forward to seeing you again soon.